Hi, everyone, and welcome to Ask a Biller. Uh, today, the topic of our presentation is going to be on uh, whether or not you're committing insurance fraud. Uh, the agenda, you know, I'm going to go ahead and just introduce the speakers, and then we're going to go ahead and just answer some pre-submitted questions, and then we'll have some time at the end, if we have any, really, for um, a live Q&A. So to introduce our first speaker, uh, we have Barbara Griswold. Uh, she's a practice consultant and the author of Navigating the Insurance Maze, The Therapist's Complete Guide to Working with Insurance and Whether You Should, uh, which is now in its eighth edition. Uh, this year, she celebrates 32 years in private practice. She provides consultations and trainings to therapists nationwide to assist with their insurance, documentation, and business questions. Uh, she invites you to contact her at her website, theinsurancemaze.com. And then I am Avery, uh, and I've been working at Simple Practice, actually, um, you know, for three years. Uh, and after working closely with healthcare providers and coming to see the importance of, you know, understanding insurance, uh, I'm just happy to be in a position where I can go ahead and, you know, provide more information to people and, and help out in that way, just seeing how important and useful it is for everybody. And uh, so if this is the first time you're watching Ask a Biller, you know, if you go to this website here, simplepractice.com forward slash Ask a Biller series and another slash, uh, you can actually just enter in your email address and you can view all of our previous uh, Ask a Biller videos. Uh, this one will also be uploaded eventually. So, you know, if you want to go ahead and just get as much knowledge as you can, you can go back and watch all of these and take what you can from them. Uh, and now we will go ahead and get to the questions that have been submitted. I just want to say hi to everybody. This is Barbara, and uh, thanks for submitting all your questions. And thank you, thanks for making the time to be here today. I, I think this is a this is one of our top uh, presentations. We've got like 3,600 people signed up, and that's an amazing number of people. We're we're delighted to have you, and thanks for your interest in this spicy topic, huh? <laughs> so that first question, what exactly is fraud from Lydia R? Yeah, so this is a topic that um, I love to talk about. Um, let's talk just to, before we talk, obviously, we need to know what, what it is. So I've kind of put a little slide here. So one definition is that insurance fraud is the act of deceiving, misrepresenting information, or concealing information with the intent to receive benefits. And I would say probably receive benefits you might not otherwise have received if you had told the complete truth. Um, both patients and providers can commit health insurance fraud. So that's um, something to kind of keep in mind. Um, I, I don't say this later, but I remember like, for example, a client can take a super bill you've provided them with and they can alter it to get put down an extra date that you've put down and try to uh, fraudulently claim a session that didn't happen for example so i'm just kind of thinking of this now that it's really important i think to give your clients super bills that are pdf or something that cannot be altered easily um so but let's go back to the definition so it's any kind of deception any kind of misrepresentation of what actually happened that's kind of the core of insurance fraud or just concealing information if you know that not giving this piece of information might alter the way that the insurance pays that session. So um, fraud can even include, according to MHN, which is an insurance plan, the failure to maintain adequate records to substantiate services, which I think is interesting. Um, so basically, I think when we think of insurance fraud, we think of the first one though. It's any kind of misrepresentation. I think that's a really good word. Um, or not giving information that will alter perhaps, perhaps the way that the insurance plan might have paid for that service. So the next question we have is, can fraud be accidental from Jessica S. and Jacqueline L.? Right, so I called this webinar, you know, are you committing insurance fraud for that reason? Like people are like, what? How, how? I would know it, right? If I'm not doing anything illegal um, or fraudulent. However, it can be accidental. And it often happens that we are doing things that are fraudulent and we don't really know it. So it's usually a lack of knowledge about ethical practices. Um, and 
sometimes we do make those decisions to just tinker a little bit with our billing or how we reported something and we think it's fine we don't really realize that it's fraud and most of it is because uh, unfortunately and i'll say more about this maybe later that we have asked a friend how to do something and a colleague has told us yeah yeah that's fine just go ahead and do this or actually insurance plans if you call them and you ask them they sometimes will give you information to do something oh yeah, yeah that's fine don't worry about um just change the cpt code of that you're writing i've i saw this just yesterday and just bill it as an individual session instead of a couple session like that's not accurate that's a misrepresentation of what happened and uh, that is actually fraud uh, we'll talk more about that but bottom line is this person doing that might not think of that as fraud but is actually fraud so let's talk about some common thinking patterns that lead to this kind of trouble uh, often we say to ourselves, it's such a small change. No one's going to find out. The insurance plan's never going to find out that I did this instead of that or that this, that the client didn't show up that day. I'll just bill for it anyway. Whatever it is, they're never going to find out. And that's dangerous. I get paid so little by insurance. I deserve this extra money. Yes, we all feel that way. <laughs> we all are kind of feeling already kind of... Um, deprive we get that kind of de deprivation mentality and so we uh, are don't want to be um, cheated out of money we feel like we deserve or that we feel like we should get paid for services we've rendered um, and so it's very easy to, to kind of move into a mentality where you aren't completely accurate with your billing i just want to help my client get reimbursement or get more reimbursement so that's a very sweet uh, intention that we have, but it sometimes leads us to do things that aren't quite ethical. This is the way I was taught to do it. Yeah, that's a real common one. And that goes back to asking colleagues or supervisors sometimes teach us to do things that are actually fraudulent. Um, and so you have to be very careful about maybe check, making sure you get good information. We'll talk more later. And here's the other one. I don't need to know about billing procedures. I'm not on any insurance plans. And this one gets people in a lot of trouble because most therapists out there uh, do, do give super bills to their uh, clients uh, who are out of network. And as soon as you do that, the, and the problem with that is that many out of network providers tend to not be very informed about how to do billing for you know, the codes and you know, which things can be changed and which things can't be changed. So because out of network providers tend to be most, um, haven't spent as much time kind of trying to tune in to the, the ethical way to do things, they sometimes have um, maybe more problems sometimes and they end up committing fraud and not knowing it because of that lack of knowledge. What are the top five most common types of insurance fraud from Roger Evans? I felt like Roger was like teeing me up to talk about what are the five most common types of fraud. Uh, I don't know what the top most common types of fraud are, Roger. Um, I don't have numbers to that, but I just thought, okay, I'm going to divide this. I'm going to talk first about maybe some five common types of billing, and then later I'm going to billing fraud, excuse me, and then I'll talk later about like diagnosis fraud. Uh, other other types of documentation fraud and things like that. So let's just start with some common types of billing fraud and I'll make five for you. So billing for a service not rendered. This is one that we all go, oh, we know that's fraud. That's pretty obviously fraud, but you'd be surprised how often uh, people write down a, a missed session and bill it to an insurance plan and you bill it and you bill it as if it happened. So you're using a, a CPT code that's a therapy code, and um, that would be obviously fraud because you're telling the insurance plan that a therapy session happened when it didn't. Changing the CPT code. I think this is probably one of the most common ones. Um, and I would say that a lot of people are doing this primarily because from the, from the family or couple's CPT code, and remember the CBT codes are, are those five digit codes that say to an insurance plan 
what kind of service was provided. The 90837, 90834, 90847, these type of codes. Um, so a lot of people sometimes change the CPT code from what, like I'd say a family or couple session to an individual session. Um, I had one gentleman talk to me yesterday who said he had submitted them all to the health plan for a couple sessions and they had denied them all because this client was not covered for um, for a couple sessions. And they just told him, the health plan said, just resubmit them for in, as individuals sessions, <laughs> right? That's what I was mentioning earlier. So that's changing the CPT code to an individual session to make it look like the individual, but that isn't what happened. This client had been re received a couple session that the health plan, had they known it was a couple session, would not have covered it. You can't go back and now say, oh, never mind. It was an individual session, so go ahead and cover it. That's again a misrepresentation of what kind of service was provided just to get around the policies of the plan. Obviously, it can go the other way. I also see people change, uh, let me just say, I, I also see people um, reporting an individual code instead of a couple's code because sometimes the couple's code actually um, pays less. So sometimes therapists are motivated um, to either help their clients get more money back or because they don't really understand the use of the codes, we'll talk a little bit more about them, or because they want to get more money back by changing the code to an individual code. So watch out for that. That is fraud. And I have seen many instances where if in an audit, uh, the health plan kind of found out that you were providing one instead of the other and asked for money back, and it can be a lot of money back. Changing the date of a session. You might think, why would I change the date of a session? Um, sometimes people do that, like if I know that my client's health benefits are running out at the end of this month and I do two sessions in the next month, it may be that I change the date so that it falls within uh, his coverage period or an authorization. If I know my authorization ran out, maybe I'll change the date of the sessions. That would be fraud, obviously. The other thing that many people do is if they have like a double session, if you're doing a, um, a two hour session, Many therapists will, will charge like one hour on Wednesday and one hour on Thursday, though that's not at all what happened. That is a misrepresentation of what occurred, but sometimes to be sure that those are both covered, they change the date. And here's one that's happening more often, um, coding telehealth as in-person or vice versa. Um, if you find out that, let's say co uh, telehealth is not covered, which some right now telehealth is being pretty well covered, but it's starting to be less covered now that some states are coming out of the pandemic emergency. Um, so you may find that, especially as a, if you're an out of network provider, that telehealth is not going to be covered. Um, people might change the uh, place of service code to in person and um, um, vice versa. So you just have to report accurately on a bill exactly what was provided. And remember that a lot of you who do out of network, you don't realize that you have to say, you have to alter your um, your super bill to show that it was a telehealth session. Otherwise, if you don't, the assumption is that it was an in-person session. So you need to say the word telehealth in there. You need to use place of service codes, which are zero two, you need to, or, and that's changing right now, so that's another webinar. Um, and um, you need to use modifiers to show that it was a telehealth session. That's currently 95 or GT, depending on the health plan. I know that's a lot of stuff for you to intake, but at my website, theinsurancemaze.com, which I'll be sending you to at the end, there's a lot of articles on all these topics. And then another common type is misrepresenting who provided the service. Let's say an intern provided the service or an associate and you know that that person's not going to be covered by a health plan and you write it as if the supervisor provided the service. Or if you're not, a, you're not in network but somebody in your office is network, in network and you want the person to get covered and, and that person is written down as the provider. So, be super truthful about who actually was the rendering provider. 
In couples therapy, is it fraud to bill the health plans of both members for a couple session or to bill both each plan for an individual session from okay. Pam? Yeah, uh, pretty much the answer is yes. Uh, it is fraud to double bill. This would be like double dipping. You're trying to collect from two plans for one couple session. There's only one time when that is okay, which is if you have, if the your identified client is covered by two health plans. And if so, then you can bill the first one, telling them that there is a second one, get paid by the first one, and then bill the second one, showing them that the first one's already been paid, yada, yada, yada. So that's a very complex thing. But in general, you, you cannot bill twice each person's health plan for a couple session. And you certainly can't bill each person for an individual session because you didn't provide an individual session. All right. If a client is late for a session or leaves early, is it front to bill for the entire schedule of time? Janet. Thank you, Janet. I, I will jump off on this because this is a big question. Um, um, and I'm going to spend a few slides on it because it, it talks about a lot of issues related to fraud and and uh, things we need to be aware of. So let's talk about common. These are, this may be the most common type of fraud that I'm seeing out there that people don't even realize is fraud, and it has to do with session times. So it is not enough to put your CPT code or the length of the session in your notes. Not anymore, at least. Right now, health plans are requiring that you document actual therapy start and stop times. What does that mean? That means if the client came, uh, had a scheduled time from 1 to 155, let's say 1 to 150, um, and they're five minutes late, therapy didn't start at 1. You can't document 1 o'clock start time. And you have to be careful with simple practice because I believe simple practice kind of defaults to the scheduled time. So you have to like write somewhere in your note and you can either, anywhere in there, the actual therapy start and stop time. Now if the client leaves 15 minutes early, the client at least comes 10 minutes late, all of, you have to just document the therapy portion, not the scheduled, okay? So scheduled session times are not the same as actual therapy time. And you cannot include time that you spend waiting for the client or that they spend waiting for you, time you spend scheduling the next session, time you spend writing notes, making phone calls, all that kind of stuff. So it has to be just me talking to my client, providing therapy. And then you add up those minutes of the therapy time and then you assign the codes. Uh, what if you're having trouble connecting at the start of a telehealth session and you're 10 minutes late? I think the insurance plan would say that should not be included because you did not conduct actually actual therapy during that time. And we'll talk about why is this so important. So I would say that a common fraud is that you have, that we often bill for a 60 minute session when we only provided, let's say, and this is just an example, uh, let's say 48 minutes of actual therapy time because the client was late or because something got in the way. And in some ways, think of that. We are billing for 60 minutes of therapy and we did not provide 60 minutes of therapy. And if we are just writing down each week 1 to 155, 1 to 155, we are actually misrepresenting the actual session start and stop times. Now, this may seem small, but I'm going to tell you why it's big. So writing 1 to 155 for every session, even if you started late, fraud. And since you occasionally might have to do a shorter session because of that, somebody's late or something, client leaves early or whatever, be sure that you downcode in those situations to a shorter time period. If you only got um, you know, that 48 minutes or whatever, you might have to use a different code. Now, you have to memorize these codes or write them down somewhere. I'm going to run through them quickly because they are so important in billing and to billing ethically. So remember, you got your 90832 CPT code. That's individual therapy, 30 minutes. 
but there's a time range, 16 to 37 minutes. You got your 90834, which is also individual therapy, 45 minutes, 30, but that has a time range of 38 to 52. And then 90837, individual therapy, 60 minutes, but that has a time range of 53 minutes and above. So if each week you bill for that 60 minute time period, if it falls at all below 53 minutes, remember you have to downcode and bill only for the 90834 or else it was a fraudulent bill. I, and that in an audit, you can get kind of slammed for. Now the 90847 I'm also throwing on here because many of you do couples or family work. That's what that code is. Uh, that's couples and families therapy. Uh, the 90847 is with the client present. The 90846 is without the client present. And those are 50 minute codes, but are 26 minutes and above. So that one you have a lot more leeway, I think, um, for shorter sessions to still use those codes. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is that Insurance plans right now, one of the things that they're going around doing, unfortunately, some of them, not all of them, is to recoup money. They are asking for your documentation to see if your session times back up your billing codes. And first of all, if they see one to 155 every week, that's going to look very unbelievable. Um, and they may really question you. They are also going to make sure that if you are using an individual therapy code, that your documentation backs up that you didn't, that you did see an individual therapy uh, client, you didn't work with couples and vice versa. Um, so I want to say also that fraud is more likely to occur if you write your notes long after the session and you can't recall actual start and stop times. So this is another plug for the importance, and I can't say enough about how important it is to write your notes as soon after the session as possible. I have a whole webinar on um, what should be in your client notes and how to write great notes to back you up so you don't have to worry if your notes are um, requested and they're being requested more often. So I'm going to give you a link where you can find out more about that. So the consequences of these things, and you might think it's very small, is that not only are, as I said, you can lose credibility in an audit if you're writing the same times every week, and you might be asked for money back. Uh, even money you've already been paid by an insurance plan or that your client has already been paid, or they may refuse to pay for sessions that you have done or refuse to pay your clients. That's a very painful one, even if you're an out-of-network provider. Uh, and then if they they are questioning you, they may say, hmm, we don't really like how this looks. Let's look at your other charts um, and, and claims that you've submitted. So as much as possible, the session time issue, if you can just each week write your start and stop times and bill accordingly to the therapy portion, it's a great, great thing. And my webinars, I have one on just on audits and records requests and one on what should be in your progress notes. And I'm going to put the links at this page that I have created for everyone watching this. Um, it's a special web page that has all kinds of resources, and I'm going to give you some freebies later, so stay tuned at the end. Um, it's at theinsurancemaze.com forward slash fraud. So just write that down now. Everything that I'm talking about today, I'll give you some other things that are going to be at that website, theinsurancemaze.com forward slash fraud. I'll mention it a couple more times. The next question here, how can I manage sliding scale fees without risking insurance fraud? Is it fraud to charge a private pay client less than your paneled insurance rates? From Kelly M and Jessica F. Yeah, great questions, ladies. Um, definitely, we. this is probably an area that we got the most questions about or that I get the most questions about in terms of fraud. Um, and people have a lot of misinformation about this. There's a sense that you have to charge the same thing you charge your insurance clients, uh, there, that you can't do sliding scale free fees or else that would be fraud, that you can't charge two clients who at the same insurance plan different fees. I mean, we have all these kind of myths out there. So um, 
Let me see, do I have the next slide on that? Yeah, okay. So let's just talk a little bit about sliding scales. If you are a network provider, so you're in network with some health plan, you can slide your fee only during the deductible period. Okay, so the client is paying out of pocket during that period, but be sure you reflect the actual client payment on the on the claim form. Okay. Um, so basically, that I'm sorry, that's probably, I, you don't need to say that. You don't need to put the client payment on the claim form. <laughs> you can slide your fee during the deductible period. Um, what I meant to say is be sure you reflect your actual charge on the client claim form. So if I have, uh, if I'm working with Blue Cross and my contracted rate with Blue Cross is let's say $100, um, but my during the, the deductible period, my client can't afford to pay me $100 each time. And remember during the deductible period, <clears throat> if you're in that work, the client pays you the contracted rate, not your full fee. Okay, so back to our example. Um, if my client can't afford to pay me the $100 during her deductible period, and I wanna make it $60, I just have to make sure that when I submit the claim, I put $60 as my charge so that only $60 gets char credited toward her deductible. We can't have $100 be credited toward her deductible when she only paid me $60. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> you may not waive a client's copayment or deductible. Now that is not a fraud issue, it, but it is a violation of your contract with the plan. Um, you can't ahead of side time say to a client, look, I'll just, I'll just uh, collect from your insurance plan and you don't need to pay your co-payment. You, your contract with the insurance plan says that you will collect co-payments and deductibles. Now, if you're an out of network provider, which means you never signed any contract with the health client's health plan. You're free. <clears throat> You're free to set any kind of fee with that person that you want to. You can slide your fee if you want, <clears throat> uh, but you can slide down, but not up from your normal fee. So if your normal fee or your full fee, I sometimes call it, or your services, let's say your usual fee to anyone walking in off the street is 150. You can't say, oh, well, do you have insurance? So I, I'm gonna charge you 175 because you have insurance. That's more than my usual fee, but I know that you're going to be getting money back, okay? So you have to offer that sliding, that rate your normal fee to anyone, whether they have insurance or not. And then you can slide down from that if they can't afford it. And then the most important thing is <clears throat> it's fraud to misrepresent. Ah, I'm gonna take a minute and uh, um, get a drink of water. Hold on a second. It's fraud to misrepresent your fee on your invoice. So if your client did pay Hey, let's say a lower fee at $60. You need to reflect that on your invoice or super bill. You can't write down your normal fee to try to help that client get higher reimbursement. So think of your invoice or super bill the same way that you would think of going to the supermarket and getting a receipt at the end. The receipt reflects what you paid for the carrots, not what the normal fee is. Well, it may, may say both, but it needs to be a, just a receipt for them of what they paid, and then they turn that in for reimbursement of what they paid, not what they should have paid if they were not a sliding scale fee client. And your sliding scale policy should be clear and fair. It can be simply based on the client's ability to pay. That is okay, as long as it's clear and you can articulate it, it should not be based on their method of payment. So it can't be, I have this for insurance clients and I have this for uninsured clients. Um, so again, since we're talking about fraud today, there really is no issue as for out of network providers, except if you're misrepresenting the fee that was paid to you on your invoice. And you can be submitting to two different, to the same insurance plan, 
two different clients, you may have slid your fee for one and not with another. So that's okay. If you're ever questioned, which I don't think you will be, you can explain this person needed it and uh, the sliding scale because they said they couldn't afford to pay it. And this one did not. That's very fine. Um, there was no discrimination. <clears throat> What documentation do we need to provide that a client an adjusted rate? Yeah, to? yeah, Mark. Um, so you, I'd say more that you don't, you need to document uh, if you slided a, a fee, you don't need to uh, have their tax returns or you don't need to have them fill out. I mean, many agencies do that and many people do that. And that's fine if you wanna say, I want, I only slide my fee for people who make less than X amount of dollars. If that's your, or you wanna see their tax return, you can, but it is not required. Now, again, I'm not an attorney, but the attorneys I've talked to in the past have said, as long as you have a policy and you implement it fairly and you can articulate it, document though in the client's chart that you you know, uh, told them your fee, they said they were unable to afford it, you negotiated a fee of X dollars, they agreed. So just document the conversation and how how you went through and, and, and what, was, what was said to them. The other thing I would say, and I just throw this in, is that if you slide a client's fee, do it for a period of time. Agree and write it down and document that this fee will be for three months or um, we will review the uh, slide scale fee you know, in X number of months. That way, if the client situation changes, you have kind of a built-in um, way of, of checking in with them and saying, hey, do you still need this negotiated rate? Um, I just wanted to check. So I, I don't lead people to think that this is gonna be your sliding scale forever. Give yourself an opening to check back with them and see if it's still necessary. Can you give examples of fraud related to diagnosis from Jamal W? Why, yes, I can. <laughs> um, this is a common area that we don't really think about as fraud, but we all, I don't wanna say we all do it, but we've probably all done something in the neighborhood of fraud and, um, in related to diagnosis. So let's talk about some of those. Um, many of us underdiagnose clients First of all, maybe we're seeing somebody who either has a substance abuse problem, um, um, maybe we, but they also have an adjustment disorder. Well, let's use that as an example later. Uh, maybe the person has a major depression, but we're a little bit nervous about having that go out on their uh, claim forms. So we dial it down a little bit and we report adjustment disorder with depression. So many, many therapists have a, a very understandable uh, desire to put a less, a more uh, innocent diagnosis than is actually what you're seeing. Um, this can really come back to bite you in the butt in many ways. Um, first of all, if you ever have to go to battle with an insurance company for more sessions for a client who's really hurting, uh, and you are you kind of added ammo to that. <laughs> um, in that you were kind of underdiagnosed them. And that may be hard later than to go back and say, no, no, this person needs more sessions because they have a pretty good depression going on here. Well, you've been reporting it to them all this time as an adjustment disorder. And so that can be problematic. Um, so be careful about that desire to dial down the diagnosis. Um, and that is actually fraud because you're basically not putting what you really see and the, the, you're not reporting accurately to the insurance company. Um, making up a diagnosis or a more serious diagnosis to get reimbursement. So that's the other end of this coin, right? This one, I would say, is something that I, I talk to people who work with couples a lot. You know, maybe your couple is coming in and they just want to <clears throat> do communication work. They want personal growth work. They uh, are fighting a little bit more than they want to, but there's really not a mental health issue going on here. Sometimes people will just put down an adjustment disorder or they'll put down uh, dysthymia or anxiety or something just so that they can get insurance reimbursement. And hopefully you can see that a little more clearly that one is insurance fraud. There's 
the insurance would not have covered this if you did not misrepresent um, that this person had a mental health issue. So that one you have to be careful about, obviously. Um, don't be making up diagnoses or more serious diagnoses. And then this one is a surprise to many of us. Uh, not writing all the diagnoses on a claim form can also be um, fraud. So for example, if I had somebody who has depression, but they also have substance abuse, um, and I think to myself, oh, the depression's enough to get their coverage. The insurance plan doesn't need to know about the substance abuse, and I don't put that down. Um, that can be considered fraud because I did not give the insurance plan the entire clinical picture of what I'm working on. And had I done so, they might have made a different reimbursement decision. They might have said, oh, wait a second, there's substance abuse going on here. We aren't sure we want to cover weekly therapy uh, one hour a week. We would like this guy to be um, evaluated at an intensive outpatient program, or we would like some other uh, type of treatment to be looked at, or I'm not sure. So the bottom line is you need to give them all the information uh, or else that is fraud. If they, uh, let's see what else do I wanna say about diagnosis. Uh, yeah, that's a good start. Okay. What if I don't find any diagnosis other than personal growth or relationship issue after the first session from Maria G? Yeah, so um, this happens, I think some of us don't kind of realize we need to always be looking at this issue that, and you may even want to tell clients that we're going to use the first session or two uh, to, to see whether this is something that can be billed to your insurance. Um, clients often think, and sometimes we even think that whatever they bring in, we will make it so that the insurance can be billed. But I know that for me, I'm always looking in that first session in my whether there really is anything here that can be billed to an insurance plan. So what we're talking about here is medical necessity. Um, and usually insurance plans do not bill, uh, pay for just a Z code, which are those old V codes where marital problem or parent child problem or some kind of basic thing. They usually need something like a mental health illness, like depression or anxiety or insomnia or substance use or you know something like that like that so um you know if the client's coming in the couple's coming in for example for uh sex uh, or self-esteem better sex or self-esteem those are things that usually insurance won't cover so you need to be looking for a diagnosis if there's no diagnosis we need to be having that little chat with them which goes something like hey, you know, I'd be happy to work with you. Your issues sounds like are, are just the type of thing I, I work with all the time, but I need to let you know that insurance will not cover uh, just personal growth work. Um, they will only cover it if you have a mental illness. And the good news is I'm not hearing anything that is telling me that you're having anxiety or depression or that type of a thing, but um, the, the downside is it isn't going to be covered by your medical insurance. So whatever uh, framework you want to uh, have that little conversation with, it's something that you need to do at the beginning of work and can be in the middle of work. They could have come in with a major depression and you've worked with them for a while and at some point they've, they no longer have that insurance. So it's, they no longer have that, um, excuse me, diagnosis. And so it's important to make sure that whatever, uh, it would be fraud to continue to put down a diagnosis. Oh, I think that I'm jumping the next question. Let's look at the next question. <laughs> there we go. Is it fraud to continue putting a diagnosis like major depression on a claim form after a client has improved for Michelle? Yeah, so that was what I was just starting to say is that yes, you have to continue to look at the diagnosis you're putting down each week when you're meeting with somebody that is it still true? Um, has it gone from major to depression severe to moderate to mild? Has it, is it still a depression? Is this person moved into personal growth work and they're bringing you a Starbucks and just like chatting with you? At what point is it fraud to continue to put down a, a diagnosis that no longer exists? Are you misrepresenting what you're seeing clinically. 
I just got a records request from an insurance plan. I want to clean up my notes. Is this fraud? I'm Christian S. So what I want to say about this is I'm a um, consultant, therapist all over the nation, call me every, I get calls every day on this topic. And this is what I hear. Oh my God, I have not, I have not taken notes. I am three months behind in notes. I, um, my notes are just terrible. And now I get a records requests and this is happening more and more and they are panicking. They're panicking. And I just, it, it breaks my heart. So I really can't encourage you enough to act every day as if an, a records request is coming tomorrow on all of your clients. <laughs> and, um, because it is fraud to do any kind of cleanup of your notes, to go back and change any of your notes, to write notes, to rewrite notes, all of that would be fraud. The prob reason it's fraud is that you are gonna try to go back and write notes as if they were written on that day, which is fraud, and that you're probably going to lie about when the note was written. Because if you write the date of service and then you write a note, you're giving the impression to anyone who reads it that that note was written at the session or, or soon after, and that would be you know, incorrect. So at least be truthful about when a note was written. It's fraud to make it appear that you wrote a note at the time of a session when you didn't. If you add something to your notes, you need to say when it was added. That would be truthful. I hate to see therapists feel like they need to either uh, suffer some pretty bad consequences if they turn in the notes that they currently have and maybe have to be asked for money back because they don't have notes to support their billing or they're faced with committing fraud and going back and trying to rewrite notes that don't exist. So please, please, please don't put yourself in that position if you get nothing else out of today. And some plans even have rules about late notes. For example, Optum, I saw this at one place, if an entry is made more than 24 hours after the service was rendered, the entry should include the date of service, the date of the entry, and the notation that it's a late entry. So some health plans will tell you if you're going to put it in late, you should basically say when you entered it. Now, if you use simple practice or other some other ones out there, it's gonna tell you when the note was created, right? Uh, there's going to be a, a place that says when the note was created too. And so whenever you enter late notes, uh, days afterwards, weeks afterwards, that does not look good if your notes are ever requested. So really, really work to get them in on a reg in a on a time um, schedule uh, within a day at least, or perhaps two days of the session. And I just say keep notes the way you'd want your doctor to. I mean, detailed and timely. Timely is so important. You cannot clean up your notes. And if you fall behind, which so many of us did during COVID, and some of us were, were already behind before COVID, don't get avoidant. Contact me for a consultation. I'll help you make an action plan. I can even refer you to someone who has a um, paperwork boot camp, and they help you like one, one by one um, to catch up on notes. So it's a support team basically which is great all right my supervisor told me to put her name on the claim form as the rendering provider for my sessions my name isn't anywhere on the claim is this fraud or mass yeah i would say this this one uh may, maybe i argue with people a little bit i think it's fraud um to do this I have lots of people tell me that they do it and that they've told by the insurance plan that it's okay. I'm always afraid that even if the insurance plan has told you it's okay, that again, the person telling you it's okay often gives you uh, one information and then when it comes time for uh, an audit and they say, wait a second, we wouldn't have paid this if we knew it was you. Um, and then they ask for money back. So I always feel like it puts you, it's a very risky thing to do. Uh, in general, I tell people on your um, to, to always put the rendering provider, meaning you, 
uh, your NPI on the claim form and your name and then your supervisor can also sign. Uh, the same thing with an out of network um, super bill. Always have the rendering provider clearly stated and the supervising provider both maybe should sign and then let that claim either be processed or not, but at least you are truthful on it. Um, so. If you realize you made a mistake on an insurance claim and don't correct it in a certain time frame, is that insurance fraud from Samantha? I would say that when it depends what it is, uh, you know, if you made it a mistake and you ended up getting money that you shouldn't have gotten, it's fraud to probably keep that money <laughs> that you got. So we, you do need to contact the health plan and make sure if you made a mistake and it led to you getting benefits that you shouldn't. Um, and I think that that's probably what she's asking. Um, I don't know that fraud says you need to correct it within X time frame, but just again, make sure that you don't get monies that you shouldn't have or that your client doesn't. What are the penalties of insurance fraud from Omar A? <laughs> well, just really generally, the major penalty that I think we are worried about um, is getting money asked for back and claims, uh, insurance plans, most notably Optum, United Healthcare, United Behavioral Health, that's all one insurance plan. And Medicare and Medicaid are the ones that are doing the most uh, clawbacks, I would call them. So they're the ones looking at your charts, asking to audit your charts and to see your notes, comparing your billing, and then often asking for money, even 18 months of after the fact, a year, 18 months worth of sessions. I saw one gentleman who they asked $19,000 back because he had did not have good notes to support his um, documentation, his billing, excuse me. Um, so uh, there's, there's these financial clawbacks. You can get fined for fraud. You can, you know, the worst case, you can end up in prison or, you know, there could be licensing board. Um, consequences. So this is not small potatoes, um, but I think the most common penalty is really uh, money back. Um, what precautions can I take to avoid insurance fraud? Jamie asked. Yeah, yeah, let's look on the positive side now. Uh, like I said before, always act now as if someone is going to ask for your notes tomorrow. Um, and um, and your billing and just be super honest. I don't know how to say that, but okay. First of all, don't guess. Um, sometimes when we don't wanna take the time to figure out what's the right CPT code and how it can be used or whatever, we just like put something down. So don't guess, uh, take time to get trained on billing. Even if you're an out of network provider, I have a whole webinar that's just what out of network providers should know about billing. And I just wanted to make it so like, I know that there's all kinds of stuff you don't need to know about insurance, but there is stuff you need to know. And I do see out of network providers uh, need, make some big mistakes that lead to problems. So um, beware of asking colleagues about billing. I hate to, to say this, and many of your colleagues may be very knowledgeable, but a lot of them are not. So if you have billing questions, really, direct them to me. It, you can just shoot me an email. And if it's very short, I'll just shoot you an email back. But at least you'll know that it's um, from a pretty solid source. Um, this seems to go without saying, but always be truthful in your billing and diagnosis. I will tell you probably once a month, at least, I'm very tempted to maybe not be completely truthful. And you just have to keep reminding yourself that I, I need to be completely truthful just in my diagnoses, in my billing, and constantly be making sure that what I'm, I can back up anything that's there. Remember also that your clients can ask for their charts at any time. And so they could go over it and say, um, you know, see what's there and uh, make sure that it's truthful. So inform the client and let them make decisions about what's released to their health plan. Uh, remember that you are the custodian of the client's chart. And we have to be thinking of that. You can't be not taking um, notes. Uh, but if a client does, excuse me, the health plan does ask for your notes and things like that, you can inform the client. And if you're out of network, say, 
hey, you can make decisions about what is released to their health plan. Actually, even if you're in network, if the client says, I don't want you to release my chart, okay, well then you pay me for these sessions, right? <laughs> that's the rest of that sentence. So uh, that's fine. They get to make those choices. Watch your thinking, watch yourself from falling into those patterns that I was talking about before in terms of, oh, they'll never notice, they'll never find out, um, they, it's a small thing, they're already taking too much money from me, blah, 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 watch out for those. And definitely take a course on what should be in your notes. So if you do get a records request, uh, you don't panic, you aren't tempted to commit fraud by writing or rewriting the notes. Um, that is a huge area that people are just faced with, and it just breaks my heart again to see people having to be faced with, do I commit fraud and rewrite my notes um, or write notes that aren't there? Or do I suffer some pretty severe negative financial consequences by turning in what I have or admitting I don't have them? And here's some freebies that I wanna talk uh, offer everybody. So that yellow link that's there, theinsurancemaze.com forward slash fraud. I want everyone to write that down or go to it. And I'm gonna offer these two articles, one, one which I'm really excited about, the 13 ways that you might be committing insurance fraud, which goes into more detail about different things that we talked about today or more about what we did talk about. And this article that I really love called Miss Sessions, what does being nice cost you? Here, I, it's a little bit related. It's not really related to fraud a little bit, but not too much. But I just wanted to offer this because it's gonna teach you how to make thousands of dollars more next year, this year than you did last year without lifting a finger and doing anything differently. And you're gonna love it. Um, why not, right? Why not make thousands of dollars more uh, in 2022 than you did last year? Um, and join my mailing list there. And you can see my other webinars or other ones that are coming up for simple practice or ones I'm sponsoring, other cool resources. And as these things are changing, there's lots that you guys need to be notified of, like place of service codes changing and telehealth modifiers changing and all that stuff. So write that down, theinsurancemaze.com forward slash fraud. Don't forget the the insurance maze. And that's my contact. You can go there also just to contact me. All right. And then we have more webinars coming. Well, I'll let you do this, Avery. Yeah, more of them coming your guys' way. Now we have Ask the Experts, working with uh, eating disorder clients on February 24th. And then Getting Started with Insurance Billing with Barbara Griswold uh, on March 10th. Yeah. And then now we have a chance to go ahead and get to some other questions that came in. Uh, the first one I have here is, is it considered insurance fraud if your rates for a therapy session are lower than what insurance pays? Is it fraud if they're lower than what insurance pays? Oh, oh, okay, I know what that is. Okay, yeah. So my at one point my rates were like 120 or something. And no, they were 110 at that point, I think. And then this insurance plan actually offered me 125. And yeah, it felt wrong. And I think it was would be wrong to charge that insurance plan uh, 125 when there's nobody in my private pay practice that was um, that I was charging that amount. So basically I can't have a insurance plan amount and um, that is higher than what my actual fee, that seems to be misrepresenting what my fee for services is. So I, I think that you uh, then have to make the decision whether you're going to build insurance your actual rate and not charge them the full amount you could get from them or whether you're going to increase your private pay rate, which doesn't mean you have to increase everybody in your private pay. It just has to be your starting point. With, in my example, would have to be 125. That's what I'd have to put out to everyone and say, hey, my, my rate is 125 and I can always go down from there, sliding scale for everybody if I want to, but I have to still start at the same number. So the other question is, I am a group owner. Can we bill for other services under our MPI? Can I bill for other services under my MPI? Yeah, I would have to hear more about that. I'm sorry. If you want to contact me directly, I can try to answer that one. Okay, another one here. 
if working with couples, is it considered fraudulent to bill under one or both insurances and bill as an individual session? Yes, because if you did a couple session, that was one of the things we talked about before. You can't bill for an individual session. All right, I'm gonna pick this one. Uh, what about changing a diagnosis during therapy? Example of example of seeing a client for over six months, and then in parentheses, GAD, uh, and they've improved significantly, and their diagnosis needs to be updated. Is this something that would flag insurance as well? No, in fact, it would be encouraged. I mean, you are checking your diagnosis, you're making sure that it's accurate at the time, and that's, in fact, all of us should probably, not should probably, but um, that would be something that would be expected during the course of therapy. Either maybe I'm meeting with somebody and they have depression and then about three months into it, they start getting truthful that they've been abusing, you know, uh, marijuana. And I add that diagnosis because it becomes clear that there's a, a, a addiction issue here or whatever, or they were abusing alcohol, make it easier. Um, and so you can add to diagnosis in the middle, you can subtract diagnosis in the middle, uh, you can alter if they go from severe to moderate to mild, as we talked about, or as I said also, they may um, not have a diagnosis anymore and then you stop billing. Uh, we have one, you mentioned having a book, where can we find this resource? Ah, oh, if you're looking at the screen right now, <laughs> <laughs> theinsurancebase.com. Yeah, right there. I have a book which is basically it's it's called uh, yeah what is it called Navigating the Insurance Maze: The Therapist's Complete Guide to Working with Your insu with Insurance and Whether You Should. So long mm -hmm. title. And then we have if you do a long couple session, example one hour and thirty minutes, is it fraud to bill one person's insurance for nine zero eight four seven and then bill the other person's insurance for nine zero eight four seven? Yeah, well, first of all, if you did that, uh, you would have to go over the 26 minutes to, to bill, right, for the second part of that session. Um, so it couldn't be 90 minutes. It would have to be like, oh, no, you're right, because the first one's 50 minutes. Um, yeah, I would say that um, I th feel like that's not quite ethical. You could make an argument, but I, I feel like that's trying to uh, that's really a misrepresentation of what happened. What really happened is that you did a 90 minute session or a 90 whatever minute session that was a couple session. And are you going to tell the, when there's an identified patient, which is how it needs to be with couples that when you're billing insurance, are you gonna say that the first 50 minutes you focus mostly on the client with your identified patient um, for that part of the session and you have a treatment plan you're kind of focused on moving the client along with that treatment plan. And then the last 30 minutes, you switched and you worked more on the issues of the other identified patient and you worked more on the treatment plan you have for that person. And you're gonna document these separately in two separate charts and that each one of them has a diagnosis. It's just, I feel, it doesn't feel right. And to me, I trust my gut. Like, I think I'm trying to get away with something that the insurance doesn't cover. So I feel like I would just say to this couple, hey, we, we wanna do 90 minute sessions. We all agree that's best, but your insurance really only covers one um, 60 minute or 50 minute couple session per day. And so the rest you can pay, you know, you could contract with them for uh, um, the extra time. Watch my couples webinar on couples webinar, the couples therapy billing, and it talks about all these little intricacies of couples therapy billing, which are very nuanced. All right, well, with about uh, 30 seconds left, I think we're gonna end it here. Um, but I just wanna mention to everyone that you're gonna get a recording with the slides in a, a follow-up email tomorrow, okay? Uh, so again, everyone, thanks for joining and we'll hope to see you next time, okay?